Uh, my name is Rob Kaufman. Uh, my talk this month is uh, Action Mailer in Action. Um, you can find my blog and eventually more stuff about me at notchase.com. You can email me at rob at notchase.com. And um, you see a lot of like the very, very basic setup of, you know, making, you know, doing script generate to get a mailer object and, you know, setting up the SMTP part or whatever. But no one really talks about, like, how you use Action Mailer once you get past that, like, this is how you send a very basic email, or talks about any of the tips that will make sending out emails and interacting with your customers a little safer for you. Um, Action Mailer allows you to both send and receive email. Most people just use send. Um, the email parsing thing is really cool, but I, I don't, there are a lot of, I don't know, it seems sort of half-baked still. Um, Action Mailer is more MB than MDC. Um, you don't generally go through a controller um, to send mail out. Um, there's a model portion, and then there's a view portion, but um, everything's kind of bundled into the model. Um, the model lives in app model along with all your other model files. Um, it inherits from Action Mailer base instead of Action Record base. The views um, are just like uh, regular controller views. They live in the views directory. Um, you can do plain text. You can do XML. You can do all kinds of different formats. You can do multi-part pretty easily. Um, it's all handled the exact same way as the DRB is on um, the controller side. So we're going to talk about safety first. Um, because this is email, because you're interacting with your customers, and because it's not that hard to send out emails on accident, um, or emails that contain accidents, it's important to um, sort of spend some time and really like come up with some safety, you know, some things that are going to keep you from damaging that customer relationship by spamming or by putting out crappy emails or sending out an email to 50,000 people that says, hi, F name, comma. Um, you need to be careful about real email addresses in your development environment. Um, a lot more people than I'd like to acknowledge tend to pull production data in, and some of them do it in the production on their local development machine. That will really screw you up. Because there isn't a lot I can, there's not a lot of safety you can do there. Except you know, it's just a problem. So if you're going to use real data, you want to drop it into your development environment, and you probably want to take some of the precautions that I'm going to show you in these next slides to keep from sending real email out. Because most of our OSX boxes have send mail on them and are just perfectly happy to send out an email if that's what you choose to do, whether you mean to or not. Um. Quantity of email is something you have to be careful about. Um, if you're going to send marketing emails, you really should use one of the marketing providers um, and keep your own local email server for just user communication. You know, hey, we added a new feature. You can go out to everyone in your list, but it doesn't need to have, you know, hi, John, we added a new feature. And you can send that through one of the marketing providers. We've had discussions about this on our mailing list a couple times, um, and there's some really good pointers there. Um, the reason for that is you'll get marked as a spammer in nothing flat, especially if you're a relatively new website, um, especially if you just bought your IPs or if your IPs were given to you by your host. Um, there are fewer and fewer clean IPs out there. You know, there are fewer and fewer IPs that have never been on a blacklist. And most of the time, when you get a set of IP, block IPs, at least one of them is dirty. Um, which means the reputation for that IP address is already ruined, and it takes a lot of effort to build that back up and get off AOL's blacklist and Yahoo's blacklist and, and all these people that will just drop you straight into their spam filters. Um, the hardest part about not being a spam, not being marked spam is, is it's sort of a black art. Everybody does it differently. Um, you know, Yahoo, for instance, every time you try and send them an email, the first time you try and send it, they say, oh, no, I don't want to talk to you. Come back later. 
and it isn't until the second time that you try to send that message that it actually goes through. Um, AOL has their own very sophisticated set of spam protections, like what gets your mail marked, a message marked, you put in the spam filters on Gmail, Hotmail, any of the sites. It's different for every single one, and most of them, they're not sharing what that process is exactly, because they don't want people to be able to go around it. Um, so, this is a checklist that um, I used in the past, especially when we had multiple people creating and committing um, various forms of email to our server. Um, and uh, this particular email system, there's some stuff in here about tagging. It was set up that you would tag um, a lead, which is our, like a user, um, with just a, an object. And then there was a mail queue that would go through 500 at a time and send those emails. The site was doing enough traffic that it just completely killed um, send mail or post it if we let it email out whenever it wanted. It would just bog down the whole system. Um, you know, we were doing, oh, geez. There was one point where we were doing about 10,000 um, page hits in about half an hour's time during a big spike, and basically enough people were filling out that form that they were getting the, the new email, so, you know, welcome to our site email, and it just was filling up. So we built a queue system, and it was the tagging stuff in here is about that queue system. Um, basically, notifier test. The model was called Notifier, so you, you know, write a test case for it. Um, and then Notifier was the model name, so you go into, mo uh, into the model and, and add a new method that basically sets up the subject and who to email to and that kind of thing. Um, and then you create your template for your view. Um, and then one of the things that's really important is to verify that the email body includes the link to an unsubscribe. Um, most likely the FBI isn't going to catch you if you send out an email without an unsubscribe, but if they do, it's like 10 grand a piece. So, you really don't want to have that happen. Um, continuing this list, uh, we found, especially AOL, um, they send you an email when someone marks your message as spam if you sign up for their program. That, quote, that email does not contain the original email address. Okay, so you have to have some unique identifier in the body of your email that says who it is that that wants to be unsubscribed, who it is that you need to stop sending email to. Otherwise, you continue to send email to that address, and AOL eventually hates you, and they just tell you to go away, and they stop accepting any mail from you at all. Um, the first freeze out is 24 hours. Um, I'm told the second one is a week, and I'm told that if you blow it a third time, they just don't ever accept anything from your IP address again. Um, so we started putting an object, a unique object idea in our email. Um, I just hide it down there at the bottom. If it's an HTML email, I often put it in a hidden div, and that seems to work pretty well. Um, I saw an email the other day that just said unique email ID colon and then that number, which I guess explains it a little bit. It's not just a mystery to the users. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. You need something in your email that you're going to be able to track back to that message, basically. Um, if you're sending HTML, you need to verify the MIME type, otherwise it'll send really, really ugly text, uh, text emails. It'll just, you know, it'll be a raw HTML dump of your email. Um, then test, put, commit, and push. And because we're adding a tag, we were using the bootstrap, uh, rake tag to load those tags up into our system. Um, then before you send the message, you want to, you know, this particular process calls for, um, a copy to be sent to the designer to tell me that, you know, the pixels are, I'm off by one pixel here, and the font is 11 point with 12, and um, our marketing folks. And then uh, the next step is actually kind of covered by the first step in this process, but it does need to happen. Um, having someone else look at it, because the chances of misspelling something or, you know, something little and stupid happening are good enough. And especially for these emails, we were sending them out to large groups of people. And we just really want to make sure that we were doing it right. Um, 
And then the last step in this process is to run the email check rate pass, um, which has had a name change, but it does appear later on in this presentation. Um, I had set up my local box so that any email that the PostFix install on OSX got automatically rerouted to my per my local inbox. So it just removed the e email name and, and put it back in. So that no matter what, if I had, you know, real data in there or even just, you know, email to exa at example.com, um, uh, it would automatically just, you know, show up in my mailbox so I could see them. Um, Matt Amanetti told me that solution sucked, so I wrote this solution. Because uh, that solution required that you custom change the setup in each box. And of course that means either postfix config or exim config or send mail config or qmail config or yeah. And they're all different and they're all ugly and they're all kind of an art unto themselves um, that hopefully you don't have to spend too much time with. So this, which I'm going to be releasing as a plugin, um, the code's written. I applied for a Ruby Forge project. I'll probably get it in the next day or two. Um, and then this will go up. It's called Mail Safety. Basically what it does is this code that you see here on the screen opens up Gmail, which is the Ruby mail object encapsulation, um, and sets the destinations method, which is where the email is actually going to be sent, to always be a constant. So it's just overriding the, the normal destinations method, which takes the two, the CC, and the BCC, and you know, returns those, and says, okay, we're always going to send every email message out to one place. Um, the init for this only includes it if the environment includes it always if the environment is not production. This is another thing that can be really helpful if you're using a staging server. Um, a lot of times you'll set up your staging server to just get a copy of the production data, right? Because then you really know you're testing the right thing. But then it has the opportunity to be sending out email. So you really want to say, you know, if it's not production, do this. As opposed to if it's development, do this. Um, again, this doesn't protect you from someone loading up their production data in production on their local box, but it's only do so much. Um, setting up email testing is pretty easy. If you do script generate mailer, you get this boilerplate code automatically. Um, it will make a test method um, in the unit testing directory and um, it will include this stuff. I mean, that's, that's how it is. Um, what this does is it makes sure that your setting is set to be test as opposed to send mail or SMTP. It says perform deliveries um, and then it makes the deliveries array empty so that every time you run a new test case you don't have the old emails just chilling in there. Um, waiting to be delivered, and the testing delivery goes to nowhere. It just goes into this array and sits there and waits for you to come check it and see that it did what you wanted it to do. Um, it makes a new email and then sets its content. Type. This actual code that you're looking at here is the RESTful helpers like automatically generated user email. Small. Oh, well, I tried to cover a lot on this slide. Um, I use a custom assertion called assert email, um, generally. Basically, it just covers all of the bases of things I was checking over and over and over again, and I got tired of writing it. Um, you see that method up at the top? Basically, the things that it checks for is it checks that the prompt is what you wanted it to be, the to is what you wanted it to be, that the subject is what you wanted it to be, that the lead ID or the you know the item ID appears somewhere in the email. Um, you can put fragments of code. Uh, for instance, the one on the bottom, the example on the bottom shows looking for the phrase here, John, which you know maybe that's the the name of the user. You can change that. You can have to test them. Um, and you can put any number of fragments in that array. Um, and then it goes ahead and, and checks that the uh, body of the email matches what you said. So, it's just a simple uh, kind of helper that wraps up a bunch of assertions that I was using all the time. Okay, um, I also wrote a rake task 
that basically sends out your email to the big four. It sends it out to AOL, Hotmail, Gmail, and Yahoo. You have to create a test account for these. Obviously, you can see that these ones, um, all of the different carriers have different names for what's allowed with, and what characters are allowed in the in the username. So you can see I started out with the dash, and the dash would be legal at um, AOL, so I got rid of it. And I tried to underscore at Yahoo, because the Edlo and Test all run together with taken somehow, and then the Gmail didn't allow dashes or underscores. So, um, one of the things about this rate task is it will actually, if you have a program called Free Pop, which basically is a set of scripts that allows you to log in to, basically it takes Hotmail or one of those type of accounts on one end and gives you a pop interface to it. And it's, it's doing web scraping. But it, it makes it look like just a generic pop interface, which um, it's written in Lua. It's not in Ruby, but it works really good, and uh, it's easy to set up. So I set it up on one of my servers. You can see here it was called 109, and uh, we could just basically, it would check that the email was delivered. It was completely automated. The only thing you had to do was um, you had to kind of run it, you had to kind of run it on a timer, so I have a, a get statement, so it waits for you to input something, and you know, hit error one. Because, um, especially for like AOL, it often takes 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, for an email to arrive to these guys. Um, so, rake email sends, just sends all of your templates. It walks through the um, use directory and sends an email for each one. The, um, you can specify which template you want with a, a variable at the command line. Um, that can actually be a comma separated list of them. Um, the e right email accounts check is where the real magic is. It does the send and then wait for you to hit enter and then goes through and checks all those accounts. Um, and when you're done doing that, you can say flat out, okay, you can't use the word, um, Free lo or the phrase free loan to get you in all the spam boxes. You know, you can't, you know, you have to take the word Viagra out of that email or it's never going to show up on our users' uh, inboxes. Um, it at least tells you that this is either going to get in or not get in. Um, account check just tells you how many emails are waiting and uh, account clear just removes all the mail in that account very blindly. So, like, you really want to set these aside to be separate test accounts and not normal user mail accounts because they just clicked all of them. Um, yeah. That's it. That's all I have. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Um, actually, I've done that for some small installs where I just wanted to go through a Google account or a Gmail account. Um, it's a pain to get working properly, but once you get it, it can be solid. Um, I've done, for big installs, you go through SendMail. Because then you're using a socket, you're not going out to CIP and back to CIP. Um, if you're doing SMTP, you're making the breaking connections a lot more instead of just going through a socket, and there's a significant speed difference there. Uh, and all of the major email sending programs for your, for, well, all of them emulate sending in some way. You know, to some level of completeness, and usually it's good enough. Um, so you can kind of use the send mail thing to, to get around from doing the socket connection. Uh, if you're sending out a lot of email, you need to do some things to speed it up because it can be pretty prohibitive. How do I schedule email? Um, I built three or four different systems to do it, um, depending on the need that you have. The simplest thing to do, the most common thing that I end up doing, is um, making a library that is active to queue. 
processor, and then tagging, you know, adding, creating some model relationship in the database that says, okay, this is the email, you know, this object needs this email sent out on it. And you add or remove that to that tag, right? And then the, the processor just goes through and says, um, you call it from like cron, and just have it run that method. And that method says, get the first 500, run them through. That's the very simplest thing that, that can work. And that's pretty consistent. It's easy to debug. And it's easy to make that more complicated. I built them where emails had to go out at specific times, um, which is a, a nice little wrinkle to throw in there. Um, I built them so that wrinkles had to go out. We built one where we were sending out marketing emails, which I said earlier was a bad idea, and it was a major pain in the butt. Okay, um, and you would send the first email within 24 hours, and the second email within the first five days after the fifth day, and then the next email at two weeks, and then continue to send mail at two weeks, basically. And it was rotating. There were five different templates, and it randomly picked one of the five templates, to send, but never the same one twice in a row. It was way more logical than it's necessary to solve problems, like. But, you know, it can be done. It, it, it's definitely doable. And the way I did it is I took that basic premise and expanded it out to, to sort of have more smarts to it. So that when it was removing a tag, it would put another tag, and the next tag knew, like, when it was supposed to be done. Um... Yeah, new signups. In fact, with if you're using RESTful Auth, you can specify when you create your models that you want an auth token, um, and it pretty much does that for you. Um, so it puts in the user table and activation code when they're created, and I mean, it, it gives you all of the templates for that. Um, and there are several good walkthroughs on how to roll your own for that. Um, that then, yeah, the tagging system, a tagging system, like I talked about, is really nice for that. The other reason it's, it's advantageous is that it then gives you a record of when the email was sent, or at least when it was dropped into your emailer queue, right? Which is about as good as you can get. Um, and so, right, and so what you do is you, um, since that gives you a direct point in time to reference, then you can say, okay, um, when a user comes back and logs in, um, you can do a couple of different ways. You can either just say, okay, I'm going to track the next time they log in and keep that somewhere in some other table and then compare the two. Um, and that's the most robust way. The other thing is you can put links in the email that have, you know, some sort of token or something. Um, but you have to keep the links really short. A lot of the email clients will cut them and people don't copy and paste. Um, or at least they don't go back and get your token most of the time. Uh, some of the email clients don't open the browser correctly, and a lot of people just type the link. Um, and there are places, big companies that are starting to, you know, basically their policy is always type a link, never just click on it. Because what happens is people put the text of the link is, you know, google.com, and the link really goes to a Nigerian, you know, scam. Right? So, that practice has meant that the linking directly via email is getting less and less effective, and putting a bunch of links in your email is another thing that gets you trapped in the spam filters. Anything else? Okay. Looks like you're up, Matt. That concludes this episode of the SD.RB podcast. See you next time.